The Florida Podcast Network, the voice of Florida. From Mallory Square in Key West to the Governor's Mansion in Tallahassee and all points beyond, you're listening to the Florida Beer Podcast, powered by FloridaBeerBlog.com. Your source for all things related to the craft beer community in the Sunshine State. And now your host, Dave Butler. And welcome back for part two of our episode with Hall Patter Brewing in Lake City, Florida on the Florida Beer Podcast. This is Dave, your host and author. Thank you so much for listening. And we're going to jump right in. If you have not listened to episode 161, that was part one of our interview with Hall Powder Brewing. I recommend that you do so because you'll hear all about the ATF raid and a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of other stuff, some fantastic beers that they have going on. With this one, we're going to really focus on the importance of what Hall Powder has done to Lake City and finally talk about the name because that is definitely something that I'm interested in, especially with something that has such a major historical focus as the name Hall Powder Brewing. There's a lot to unpack there that you may not initially realize. So I'm just going to go ahead and stop talking. Producer Steve and I are going to be interviewing Chris Candler and Jeremy Gable. They are two of the owners and founders and partners of Hall Powder Brewing. Enjoy part two. Obviously, a large portion of the experience that is Hall Powder Brewing is obvious is the physical Sure. Location. But a large part of that is also selling to your customer base. And so I'll start with asking who your customer base is, Mm -hmm. because you do have a small but tight knit community here in Lake City. But you're also so close to so much commerce and travel and movement. Who tends to come around more? So that's actually probably one of the more surprising things. when, When we were selling this, when we first opened it, we were selling it to the community or to the community leaders. We said, this is going to be a tourist destination that has become one of the more shocking. How much of a tourist destination this place has become uh, on a day like today, a Saturday will there'll be, there'll be Saturdays and Sundays where you'll walk into this place and there won't be a single local in here. It's a lot of that through traffic, people mm-hmm. coming into Florida, people leaving Florida. We get a lot of that. Hey, I was driving down 75, we're headed to Orlando, we're headed down to the beach, whatever, and I pulled up Yelp, and there's a brewery in town, so we're going to stop. But for for breweries that might not know how to do it, how do you quantify that? Do you have a guest book that people sign when they walk in? I think some of that probably comes from he the He steals staff. the credit card information. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I was going to say it's creepy how much information yeah. you can get off I of credit want cards. The real answer. No, I uh, mean so Jer's right. I think a lot of this is probably the conversations that we have with the bartenders. Just kind of in the background, it's like Cam comes up to me and it's just like, you know, <laughs> my and my No, he's talking about the punch out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, I can think of a certain Chris Tucker quote from Friday. <laughs> it's kind of what I was, wasn't expecting it. And boom. That's a good one, man. But, you know, we'll have our bartenders tell us that they met this guy from Georgia or Denver or just wherever someone flew into Florida and they're driving up the state or they're coming into Florida and it's the first brewery that they see on the list when they're scrolling through the through like Yelp or Google mm-hmm. or whatever. And so I I think that's probably where we're getting that data from. Most of it, most of it is, yeah, it's coming from our interactions. And then, and then two, one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on here at Hal Patter is the owners are here. There's, there's very few, we don't close the place down like we used to, trust me, but, but no, there's, there's very few hours that there's not an owner here. So you can see it, but we're walking around talking to people and, and when people are, coming in we saw a couple of them out in the tap room just just this afternoon they're coming in they're visiting they're they're asking they're taking pictures you, you can always tell somebody that's here for the first time because they're taking pictures of the brewery they have but a then, look too on their face yeah, they're like Holy they walk crap. in they're just looking around <laughs> like, 
losing their balance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because this building is that awe inspiring. Yeah. I take pictures of this building every time I come up to it, whether you're open or not. <laughs> well, thank you. I, thank no, you. I appreciate, appreciate that. that yeah. And that is one of the things that we're trying to get out more and more to people. Because, I, again, like I, I said it earlier, I, I think that people don't understand what we've got here in the building, and we're trying to get that out more. But yes, I do. I do mine the credit card data sometimes. <laughs> there is a fun little statistic that you can that you can dig up on your credit card data that says how many times that one credit card's been used here. Is it a first time swipe? And that's so creepy. That's just cre- that, that's yeah. some Big Brother stuff, right? <laughs> no, it is. Now it doesn't tell me who it is or anything like that, but it'll tell you if it's a first time swipe. And that first time swipe still for us. Now it's it's been it's been a couple months since I've looked at it. We're still fifty percent first time swipe here which is crazy even all these years all these years six six years in and we're still getting a, a 40 or 50 percent first time swipe and honestly it's funny too because these guys when i i bartended here for the first three and a half years and the question i would always get is what this building used to be and you guys serve by light <laughs> <laughs> But it's funny because I'll talk to these guys and I'm, we're six years into this and they still say they always get the question, what this building used to be? So to me, that just tells me we're getting a lot of first time people walking in this door. Do you get assumptions that you are part of a particular municipality's beer scene? Like, are you Jacksonville's beer scene? Are you Gainesville's beer scene? Are you Tallahassee's beer scene? Or are you basically an island unto yourself? I would say that is the, the definite answer to that. Well, no, maybe not a definite answer. Go. I might, I might say that we're probably breaching Tallahassee. Yeah. If anything, I would say yeah, I, and I, and yeah, and I think maybe Gainesville, the breweries over there, they they kind of accept us as one of their own. I don't know that the people of Gainesville accept us as that, but I, think, I mean. I think the people from the other from the outlying metropolitan areas, because those are some of the people that are in here on Saturdays. I mean, I say that there there may not be a local, but we have Gainesville people, Jacksonville people that come over here on the regular. But I think Jer's right. I think if we were to identify and I'm going to do this and he's going to love it. If we were to identify with a a local beer scene, it would probably be Tallahassee, and that is most most like most definitely due to the works of the Tallahassee Beer Society and Danny Aller. Yeah, boom, Danny, Danny, how about that? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And and to be to be perfectly honest with you, you, that answer surprises me not because I don't love Danny Aller because I do, and I got the I got I even messaged him before we came up here, and I was like, what should I try? Hoping to try to entice him out here, Danny, you didn't take the bait. But he, there are a few that he mentioned, and I know one of them is the the coconut porter that you're having, which I need to get a full pour of, okay. anyways. <laughs> but the reason that I'm a little surprised is because, and I've said this for many many years, that trip that I spent up here going to Jacksonville, the beer of Jacksonville is a cream ale. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got a cream ale. I don't care who it is, what's going on. Everybody's got a cream ale. I'm starting to realize Gainesville is kind of a Kolsch town. More so than yes. the cream ale. And I bring this up because of your big beers, of your core beers, your second in line to get canned, one of your biggest, the one that you won your first award for, Olino. if I'm correct, is Oleno Cream Ale. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I always sort of, in my mind, tied you into Jacksonville because the cream ale as a mm. style is so strong with that particular beer scene. Well, and if you want me to blow your mind a little bit, the the two beers that we will probably end up with most popular in package at this point are Ambers, which is the Seymour and Finnegan's Irish Red. And then we're, we're looking at probably competing with the Olino to be the second can in package would be the Alligator Town Amber Lager. Um, so those are selling like friggin' hotcakes right now. So we seem to be in Amber Town. We're a, we're a red weird. town. So that's weird. Yeah. You don't see that <laughs> anywhere. Well, I think too the Irish Red Ale. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting play on the market. And that's They're, Seymour and Finnegan's, right? That's, Seymour, right. that's correct. your first can, the one right. that just released, and yes. that's been out for about dis- two and a half months. Yeah, and now you are distributing, and that mm-hmm. one's. I mean, t- talk a little bit about the beer and then talk a little bit about the the success in distribution. The name? Um, or The name, the, the style, why it got so popular, kind of what you're going with. Well, so Johnny, he's not obviously here, but when we met him originally, Chris and I, he was 
brewing in his garage on his own pilot system. Like all of us did. <laughs> well, his was Oh yeah. His was over the top. I mean, I think Chris and I were brewing on like a little five uh, gallon kettle, but Johnny was brewing on this behemoth oh. system that he home built. Bu- home built hybrid herm system. You know? Home yeah. built one barrel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's still downstairs. We still use it as still our pilot use system. That thing, man. <laughs> and he's upgraded it too as, yeah. as the years have gone on. But I, I think one of the things that he had originally was a was a red Irish ale, and he developed that thing for Chris. How many years? This is this. So Seymour and Finnegan's is the the original recipe was one of Johnny's yeah. homebrew recipes, and it's been in development now. I guess I would say for fifteen years. Mm-hmm. He was brewing that for probably ten years and perfecting that. Yeah. As a as a beer. It's probably when I'm when I'm talking to customers, Olino is probably our biggest seller here in in the in the tap room. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it's probably because it's the closest thing we've got to to a light beer. Or or when we started, it was the closest thing because we hadn't started lagering yet. We hadn't we didn't have the Alligator Town Amber. We didn't have Lightest. You got you didn't have which is which is a fun beer name too because obvious reference yeah. obvious yeah. reference come here. Pe- yes. pe- people come in and they say what's the lightest thing you got and the mm-hmm. bartenders just have to point at the menu board <laughs> number 7 lightest you got but olino for a long time was our gateway beer we almost called it gateway cream ale because it was a it was a fun reference between lake city being the gateway city to florida and then also it was a gateway beer into uh, craft beer it was your gateway into craft beer well but Seymour, mm-hmm. this one, it ended up that there really wasn't that much red Irish ale in the market space. And I think at that point it was Killian's. They, they did it for a while. Uh, I'm assuming they're still... Okay. You just never see them yeah, anywhere I, well, anymore. You don't see them here. No, production seems to be scaled back a yeah. lot for some reason. And then there were a couple other breweries that we saw in distribution, but... It just didn't seem to be anything that was too major. But I think Cone were the ones that kind of pronged us on it and said, if you guys did this, it would be a good spot for you guys to kind of try to take over. And it's and it's by far our second selling. It's easily our second best selling beer in the tap room. And then what I tell people is that even, even with Olino being the lightest beer we've got, craft beer that we had on the taps, Seymour Finnegan's is probably our easiest drinker. It, it, it really is. It's, it scares some of our locals. They, they want a blonde beer. They want a light beer. And it's, and it's, it's got a heft to the color on it. Mm-hmm. But so it scares them a little bit on the color, but it is still probably our easiest drinker. Mm-hmm. It's got a nice, one thing that Johnny always wanted to kind of create in it is he's got some biscuit malt in it. So it's got a, it's got a nice roasty kind of biscuity flavor a sweet to it. Component to it's got it. a nice sweet component. So yeah, slightly roasty, but not tannic. No. At all. You guys have to walk out of here with a six pack because uh, it actually drinks better out of a can than it does yeah, on tap. It's super so easy to drink. That's yeah. weird. <laughs> no, it's super, no, it's really yeah, crazy. It's weird. My yeah. sister in law in High Springs literally had a six pack of that in her fridge because she knows I'm a beer snob. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I walked in the door, she's like, You want a beer? I'm like, Well, what kind of craps are you drinking today? And she's like, Oh, no. no. How better? I'm like, oh hell yeah! <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, so it, so and I think the other thing with it is it is it it's a brand that plays well to new craft drinkers as well as seasoned craft drinkers. So you'll put that in a total wine; it'll sell fine in a total wine, or it'll sell great in a total wine, or or in a we're in Tipples down in Gainesville, which is a, a craft beer and bottle shop. They they sell it there, and then. It'll also sell just fine in a gas station. So you're, you're selling to both markets. And then you take a look at what kind of became your runaway social media hit, Watermelon Goes. Moving into the Punch-Out! series, you went crazy, sour, fruity, fun stuff, which still shocks me for being in North Central Florida. I mean, you're, you're almost to Georgia, and you're making... Like the Tampa sours and the St. Pete sours well, and the Miami that. sours yeah. and you. that kind of crazy stuff. Why did you decide that, hey, this is going to be worth the risk? And what was the reaction? The, the simple three-word answer, 
what the hell? <laughs> you know what I mean, literally, when we opened this place, sours were not even on the radar. I mean, we had no intention. But of, a, a great summertime release. Sun's yeah. out, guns out is a sour. It's perfect mm-hmm. summertime beer. Yeah. yeah, it's hot. You want something lighter, a little sweeter, a little mm-hmm. sour, a little. Oh, those beers, those Puckery. beers, the Identity Crisis, the the Watermelon Gozas, the Fruited, we call it kind of our Fruited Goza series, but the Watermelon Gozas, obviously the flagship of that, and and then the Punch-Outs. I mean, you get out on a kayak or a canoe out on the river, paddleboard out on the river. Those are great beers to enjoy up here in, in our environment. And honestly, I, I'm not going to lie to you. We were shocked. I mean, Watermelon Goza, I think, was that the first sour that we did? There it was, has to have been. It was very early. That one, I remember I was working on the bar the night that we released that to the tap room. And it was a Friday night. And we had a great band up there. And the entire evening, all I did was I pulled that Watermelon Goza tap. And upstairs and downstairs, we blew one keg of it each and it's the half barrel keg just yeah i mean i think anyone wanted i think i think we blew a small batch of that in a weekend and and we were we were shocked we were like oh my god maybe sour maybe north florida is ready for sours but that's also where having a brewery like this where you can teach people right what style of beers can do what you can have with it what you can how you can move it and taste different things other than your bud lights or your milwaukee's Mm -hmm. or your Right. Natural. Ultras. Yeah. Ultras. <laughs> well, I, I think, too, also coming into the market when we did, we were doing a lot of the traditional styles, I'd say. But I think that's because Johnny was doing a lot of that at the time when he was working in the garage. And then I think it turned into we were trying to create an experience for people. And then realizing that sours, it's, it's a thing. People said, I think people thought maybe it was a gimmick. It would it would kind of fall away at some point, but I I think we just kind of jumped on that too. And I I mean he's done an amazing job with his sours. Yeah, honestly, no, it's a, taking second place in our very first Hourglass Smash Fest with a sour was that. Talk about walking into the lion's den. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. <My> goodness. <laughs> Yeah, so we're excited about the beers that we put out. I think the I think the fun thing too is is that we've maintained we haven't just completely hyped out on sours and that kind of thing. We can still, in my opinion, we can still brew a solid traditional style, a you very guys, good. You guys hef. found a very good balance with right. your schedule. You when to throw the sours on, when to switch it up. And and yeah. I think that and I think that we I love right now. I mean, I, I I walked in a couple weeks ago and I said, "Damn, we've got a solid lineup right now. We've got a brown, we've got a hef, we've got a we got a couple lagers, we got a couple a couple IPAs, uh-huh. we've got a couple sours." So it's a we we tend to maintain a very solid lineup right now. Has anything not hit? You just release it and just landed with a thud. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'll go ahead and of course say, of course, it was the Rauch beer. <laughs> Have you done that yet? The what now? The Rauch beer. Oh, did we didn't do? Did have we? Did done, you do one? I, I don't, don't know. Think, I don't think we. It'd be done great one. if you did. No. Usually, I ask that question, and my first is suggestion is, was it a rock beer? And usually, the answer is no, yes. No, I don't know. Johnny will not do one of those. He he refuses, which is fine. <laughs> uh, actually, probably we. I mean, obviously, we've had some flops. We and uh, and unfortunately. Our flops tend to be my favorite, one of my favorite styles, and that's saisons. They just don't sell here. Really? <laughs> he did do a really good. That, we that can do cherry, good ones. He did, but he did the. It was a, a cherry saison that he soured. It was a soured. It was a tart soured and cherry saison. That was fantastic. It was really really good. Mm-hmm. That was, was a, but that was a collab with. Was it? No. no um, it was. Was it Legacy? Legacy. Legacy Ale Works over yeah. in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. We actually did a collab, and it was a chart. Tart Imperial Cherry Saison. Oh, it was good. And it, it was, was so good. It was, it was good. It was big. Saisons don't seem to go over real well. What are some other flops that we've had? Johnny doesn't brew a flop. How about that? I'm going <laughs> to... Yeah, there we go. They all sell like fire. <laughs> well, but, but to be fair, I mean, there are very few beers that he puts out there that don't actually move. And if, yeah. if it's not moving, I think it has to do with maybe the... The, the the temperature or what the weather is doing. I yeah. Think, like the first year, I think we put on a coffee stout and that thing sat there forever. Oh, people geez, loved yeah. it and people were like, oh my gosh, bring bring Shirley's back. But we we're like, 
It's you guys don't drink it though. <laughs> the three of you love it. Yeah, yeah. The three of you love it. Yeah. You guys exactly. have done a great job. Where if you follow it, you guys have kind of led your beer audience in Lake City to what you're making for that that season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I and I guess the I guess the definition of a flop for us, and, and again because we have the audience, like you said, a flop for us may be that we've got kegs that sit around for a couple months. We're used to being able to turn kegs; they they turn over. And I'm sitting here thinking of some stuff that just hit me. Um, I mean, he did a, a bubblegum sour, and it was still good. <laughs> <laughs> We're all like, huh. I'm like yeah, yeah, that tastes good. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's some odd stuff that rolls up out of here. But Johnny, being the wizard that he is, the wizard of Zimmergy, he he just seems to be able to put put it together. That's amazing. That is amazing. So I will continue to ask: Is I find it interesting why Seymour and Finnegan's was the first beer to go into cans. Obviously, I understand Olino coming mm-hmm. in next. I'm a little surprised about the Amber Ale, but that's what it is. Are you surprised on how much traction your distribution is getting already? Should I be arrogant? No. <laughs> <laughs> just say the answer. <laughs> no, so so let's just put it this way. What we re- what we release and when is it's it's how do you put it? It's strategic. Is Olino our best-selling beer? Yeah. Do I think it would sell good in distro? Yeah, absolutely. But like you said, we're in a cream ale town or we're in a cream ale area. So if you walk out to one of our local stores, you're going to see two or three cream ales on the shelf. If you walk out into that same store, there's not a single red ale. Mm-hmm. There is not a single Irish red. Yeah. So it was strategic. We knew that we could gain, or we thought very strongly that we could gain a foothold because there's no competition. Same thing with the with the amber lager. Who's competing with the Yingling right now? So we've got a we've got a solid competitor to Yingling, which is another strong beer in our mm-hmm. in our area mm-hmm. right now. We've got a solid com- a solid local competitor to a Yingling right now. So it's it's strategic. I still think that Oli would sell, but why go out against Mad Manatee and the others that are already established in the market? We're yeah. a new we're a new supplier. We're a new brand to the package distribution market. So why swim up? Why swim upstream? Yeah, I mean, you if, know? You, if you want the funky stuff, you got to come to Tap Room. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, and I mean, there there are some IPAs that we've got slated for for package distro. There's some more traditional, some more traditional package distro styles that that we'll send out. But the idea is here is it's that street cred. It's 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 getting that foothold. It's it's getting out there and saying, okay, both with our distributors and with our consumers, yeah. Damn, mm-hmm. that's a that's a good beer. Let me try the next one. Mm-hmm. Let me choose the next one over the one that I buy all the time. Whereas right now they don't have to choose. It's the only one out there. Yep. So it's making Hal Patter that go to name. Right, exactly. You guys aren't mm-hmm. releasing garbage. You're releasing good beer yeah. every time. Try it. And I'm not and I'm not gonna throw out an IPA or we're not gonna throw out an IPA into a sea of twenty five other IPAs where and, and they're I mean, you guys have been to several breweries today that are throwing out freaking solid IPAs. There were some, but to be honest with you, we had done Swamphead earlier in the day, and mm-hmm. I did not realize what kind of market share Big Nose had. Oh, yeah. I had no idea. No, they're big. So mm-hmm. so, oh, so yeah. we have some competitors out there that are throwing out kick-ass beer. And there's just no re- you know, it's, it's It's the Rocky versus Clubber Lang. Why do it? Why not sneak in there? Get a, and I'm giving away our secrets here on your podcast. But why Everyone's not? Everyone's going to be making an Irish red now. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> you know, but why, why, why try to go in there, guns a blazing, and and duking it out when you can sneak in there and get one on the market and they know your name now? But again, in the craft beer community, if they did sneak an Irish red in there on you, it would make you guys look at your recipe, see what you can change, see what yeah, you can absolutely and change it. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. You're always adapting, always trying For to sure. do better. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that would push the style too. It would it really kind of push that style to a point that what does this market actually want in an Irish red? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think what we're doing is probably accepted. Yeah. But that's not to say that's the best, but we kind of so, want it to be. 
We really appreciate Jay Adams. There's another there's another plug. Yeah. We really do appreciate right now our, our our collaboration and our communication with our distributors because they're doing that for us. They're saying, okay, here's some slots that we've got on the shelves that need to be filled. You guys have got a great style. You guys have got a great brand in that slot. Let's throw that one out there. Let's see how it takes hold. And That's uh, amazing. After speaking to some breweries that are having significant issues with their distributors today, it's, it's, <laughs> it's well, amazing and, to hear the opposite. And I, and I think the thing, too, because, hey, two, three years ago, we would have had the same conversations. And, that, and that's not to say that, my, that we don't have issues with our distributors. I mean, we're, I was vain standing out in my temples three days ago because they missed a pickup and all this kind of fun stuff. And so... See more cases of Seymour were not available to the market when we had 200 cases of them sitting here in the cooler. So there are issues still, but the strategy that we're able to put together with them has been, is greatly appreciated and it's, and it's elevated. And I think part of that is too that we've, we've been at this for a while now. We've been in draft distro for three or four years. So we've been able to cultivate a relationship with them a little bit more instead of jumping straight year two into package and hey you guys need to buy all this so we've learned how each other it's like a relationship we've learned how to work with each other so and how to yell at each other so <laughs> <laughs> i will end with this conversation which okay. was probably where i was going to start had we not spoken about the craziness that you've had <laughs> in your in your years but lake city really is a part of the fabric of hall petter brewing it, you know definitely had a focus on the building has a focus on the community the community has a focus on you this really is the place where you want to be and yet you did not call yourselves lake city brewing you use the name hall petter why not lake city and then of course Please define or give us as much as about the life of Hall Petter. You take this one, or do, do, do you want know. the tour guide I, to take it? I don't know. <laughs> Realistically, I think there were early conversations about if there was ever to be a brewery that we were going to be a part of. Like this goes back to 2013. Yeah, Chris threw a name out. He just said we should call it Hall Petter Brewing. And now this was a drunken comp- conversation in a swimming pool. So yeah, <laughs> and it, and it's and it's funny because I don't think I think after he said it originally when I when I heard the name I was like oh no, but then after I kind of uh, kind of did some research on Lake City, it, it seemed fitting. I think how Patrick Tustanugi is the alligator chief. Yeah, he's go ahead. So. Your question is, is why not call it Lake City and why call it Hal Patter? Let's, yeah, let's start with so, that. So, so in essence, calling it Hal Patter is calling it Lake City because Lake City used to be called the town of alligator and Hal Patter means alligator in Seminole Indian. So the Seminole Indian warrior chief that settled the area was Hal Patter Tustanugi and that means warrior chief alligator. So by calling it Hal Patter, you're actually call you're you're actually hearkening back to the history of the community. Regardless, it's fun if you go back and you look at some of the old. You go to the Florida archives and things, and you look at maps of the state of Florida from back in the 1860s and 1870s. You'll see that little dot up in the north central Florida, and it says alligator. It doesn't say Lake City. So I think a lot of people it gives us the opportunity to tell that story. It gives us the opportunity because we're all about stories. Seymour and Finnegan's has stories behind the name. Olino has stories behind the name. So, yeah, we didn't call it Lake City, but in, in essence, we did. We hearkened back to a time that was before this was Lake City. And your locals and, and then get that. I think, I think a lot of our locals know. We've got streets that are named Tustanugi here. They know what, who Hal Patter was. Yeah, even Alligator Lake, there's like a, a small public park there. But they've got a statue out there of, of Hal Patter Tustanugi. And I, I mean, I, I honestly, yeah, Chris is right. I mean, it's literally, this town is, is Alligator. And which is why we called the next beer that's probably going to come out on in distribution alligator town it, i mean it, this town has a lot of history to it mm-hmm. yeah this used to be the third largest city in the state of florida really yeah before miami was big 
We were we were actually larger than Miami for for quite a long time <laughs> because we were the rain, we were the railroad hub of 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 the state of Florida. That is amazing. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Absolutely. This conversation's been a long time in the making. I'm glad it's finally here. (laughs) Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Excellent. So that is our trip to Lake City in North, 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 North Florida. We will be back next week with another episode somewhere from the Sunshine State. Got a lot of awesome things that are happening in 2024 that we can't wait to report on. And we've also got some great audio in the can from some amazing breweries that I cannot wait to share that with you. And to find out when those episodes are getting released, please make sure to follow us on social media. We are at Florida Beer Blog on Instagram, Twitter, or slash X, whatever, and the threads which I like. We are at FL Beer Blog on Facebook, on the internet at FloridaBeerBlog.com and FloridaBeerPodcast.com. And you can email us at FloridaBeerBlog at gmail.com. We are also a proud member of the Florida Podcast Network, an amazing collection of Florida-based podcasts written by and produced by Floridians, just like yourself, Probably assuming you're in florida if you're not that's cool perfectly fine which is awesome regardless head to floridapodcastnetwork.com to find more information on those please make sure to follow us on the podcasting app of your choice we are on apple music we are on spotify we are on amazon we are on iheart we are even on youtube there are so many ways to listen to the florida beer podcast in addition to the way that you're listening to us right now and if you can subscribe make sure to subscribe and if you can leave a great review please leave a great review it does help us get the word out our intro announcer is jeff brozovich our field producer is steve piccola our executive producer for the florida podcast network and grand hype hooba is jemmy lagonier this is david butler your host and author we will be back next week don't know where don't know when but it's going to release pretty soon on the florida beer podcast thank you so much for listening and drink florida craft